Hello everyone. So I am Dr. Shamath Fernandu from the Department of Family Medicine. And we are going to look at the concept of a family in family practice or general practice in this lecture. So the objectives are to understand the importance of the concept of a family in family practice. Secondly, to identify the family structures, different family structures appearing from within Sri Lanka and elsewhere in the world, and to explore contextual variations of the concept of a family, to recall the basic functions of a family, to identify the interactions between disease and family, how the diseases affect the family, as well as how a family can come resourceful when it comes to a disease. And besides these objectives, some other uh, objectives with regards to the family life cycles will be dealt with in another lecture. So why is the concept of family important in general practice? If we look at the clinical encounters, the consultations, seldom there is this person who comes all by him or self to you. But most of the time, the elderly population, the pediatric population, and not only them, but also the adults, tend to visit you in families, in groups. So sometimes they need this support from a caring family member uh, who they want to be present during the consultation so that they will also make certain clarifications with the doctor. And if they have concerns, they can discuss that with the doctor because it is not just the, the patient who is being affected due to the disease, but also the whole family is being affected due to disease, but also the family can come resourceful in um, dealing with the disease and maybe recovering from it. So there are very traditional definitions of what a family encompasses. A group of people related by blood or marriage, Oxford Dictionary. A social group of parents, children, and sometimes grandparents, uncles, aunts, and others who are related. So that means there has to be some sort of a legal or a blood relationship there. So says the Cambridge Dictionary. Or a family is a group of persons united by ties of marriage, blood, or adoption, constituting a single household and interacting with each other in their respective social positions, usually those of spouses, parents, children, and siblings. So the last definition by the Britannica Encyclopedia is the broadest definition uh, so far. But are you happy about these definitions? Are these definitions inclusive of all the families that we see in the society? So the, take the last uh, example, last definition for an example. It says about marriage, yes, if you are legally um, bound to each other, yes, that makes grounds for you to call yourself a family, or else you can be children and parents, so there is a relationship by blood, or you, even you can be siblings for you to be called family, or else there can be uh, a following a legal process of adoption. So all three of these aspects can, uh, you know, if, if people are related by these means, then they can be called a family. But are you still happy with these definitions? And Another sociology definition, a social group characterized by common residence, economic cooperation and reproduction. It includes adults of both sexes, at least two of whom maintain a socially approved sexual relationship 
and one or more children own or adopted of the sexually cohabiting adults. So are you again happy with this definition? Just go through each segment of this definition and see and compare with the different forms of family structures that you encounter in the society and see whether all those families are included in this sociological definition. But mind you, this definition is very old. It was by Murdoch in 1949. And just think, who decides whether it is this group of people constitute a family or not? Me in a minisutika, a family of Kirir Daki in the Puluan, the Barry the Clinic decide Karan only whether is it the society or is it the family. If a group of people think they have an affectionate relationship with each other and they live together and they um, share the same kind of environment and they help each other and they consider themselves a family. Can you stop them from thinking so? So just think whether this definition of a family should be a societal definition or you know whatever people think as a family should be included as a family so even the Indian texts Indian academics have seen the importance of having the family and family structure classification redefined for the current times because all along the past history if you would see like even in Sri Lanka there were families without legal bonds early in the time and then there and came all these legal um, you know uh, things between people such as marriages and even registrations and all that and now like where are we so according to the current times we need to have the definitions um, realigned so even the sociological definition, if you would see the one above, is extremely narrow and not ex inclusive. So, what do you see in the picture? Elephants? Yes. And what sort of elephants are they? So you have got a um, father, mother and a baby? Is that what you think? This is called a Tumpatrana, where two female elephants of the herd are together taking care of a baby elephant or many baby elephants. Usually the male, ele male elephant is lacking there. So the, you know, the baby elephant's father is no longer among them. But two adults have come together to care for the child or the baby elephant. So do you call this a family? So is there a relationship that is, you know, defined by marriage, blood? So what do you get out of the concept of parents? Are they not parents? Are they parents or are they not parents? No. So another thing to consider about. Traditional family structures are there. So you have known all the, all the time about nuclear families. So there can be heterosexual couples with or without children. And what about their attitude towards having children? Well, I do acknowledge that there can be, that there are so many parents who are without children and are longing to have children as well. But at the same time, the attitude towards having children is very different from one person to the other. Some couples decide not to have children at all. Right? So, what are the reasons behind, you know, not to have children? Some of them think, like, you know, the overpopulation on Earth is a problem. And I do not want to have one of my own kids to go into this society that is very toxic, 
with overpopulation. So they decide not to have children so that they can justify their decision as to why they do that. On the other hand, they can also think of adopting orphans, which is a very good thing, so that they adopt kids from orphanages and give that child a reasonably good future. Sometimes these educated couples with reasonably good jobs are able to nurture a kid and educate a kid and produce a responsible and a productive adult into the society. So they can do that. And what is this? An extended family that comprises of a nuclear family and others related by blood or marriage. So this is a very traditionalistic form of definition again. But if a heterosexual couple with or without children living with uncles and aunts, grandparents, nieces and nephews, and even uh, you know married siblings under the same roof, they can be called an extended family. How about the instance where the friends choose to live together in the same household, taking care of each other? So can you call that a family? What if even you don't really accept that to be a family, but they do? So as a family physician, what really matters to you? The legal context of being a family or how your community, your people decide what is best for them. If they are deciding what is best for them, can you just come in between them and say, okay, like you have to you know, go into separate households and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be living together. You can just really say that, you cannot. So you need to have a very non-judgmental attitude about uh, the different sorts of people who come together, who are living happily together. So the different family structures are, other family structures are also seen in liberal civilizations. So there can be unmarried sisters living together. So these sisters, they think they are very independent and they are also occupied, but to have support of each other, they are living in the same household. And there can be brothers and sisters living together and they can adopt children uh, where it is not possible in certain countries and in, like in Sri Lanka you cannot do that but in certain countries siblings working adults who also generate a reasonable income can uh, bring up uh, their kids they can even um, you know use surrogacy to make their own children or else they can adopt kids So now I am also trying for you to have a very non-judgmental attitude about your community, about the families that you see in the society. Right. And this is very essential for you to know and to practice as a health practitioner in the future. So whatever the discipline you take up, be it family medicine, be otherwise, you have to be very sensitive to the very humanely issues of the people. Right. So here we are looking at adult couples who are cohabiting or else you call them living together. So what is this concept? You know, the people of any age, two of them just think of living together. And they do that because they want to be together to have each other's support. But they think of the concept of marriage as something not really appropriate. So have you, have you thought of uh, the concept of marriage in that manner? So some, what, what some of them would think it is very unethical to form legalized form of relationships with other human beings. You do sign contracts for cars, you do sign sign contracts for property, but you not, do not 
want to sign contracts for a you know a relationship with another human being so they opt not to get married but live together until uh, you know even up until they die as long as they're happy together so there have been studies that have compared the emotional satisfaction pleasure openness and time spent together between the people who are cohabiting and those who are married but there was there was no significant difference between um, how uh, you know these dimensions of these two groups further cohabiting unions among older adults tend to be of relatively longer duration so when compared to those who are married people who are cohabiting tends to live longer together why do you think is that happening that is because they are not living a contract they are living their lives they are happy together and they are they want to stick together as long as they're happy so they this is quite unsurprising so these have been found in the you know the if you want you can f read further in the reference below so then another aspect of people so there are single parents who are either unmarried divorced or separated with children so they're usually females uh, I also have a friend of mine from Sweden so she did not want to get married uh, but she wanted a kid so she got the help of an institution that supplied her with um, you know fertility support with a sperm donor as well so that she has her own kid and you know the same way a man who wishes to have his own kid can get the help of a surrogate mother to have his own kid and there are also unfortunate incidents where incidents such as rape lead to you know women having children outside of marriage or else divorce or separation can also lead to you know have uh, even we don't um, uh, parents can have children but they have to manage everything the finances home housekeeping and the kids single-handedly which is very hard on them so again it is important that you are not judgmental but are really supportive to these sorts of single parent families so um, and some of the problems that you particularly find among the children of these uh, single parent families are conduct disorders depression and decline in academic performance so um, it is however for many others for for many children this experience of you know being uh, brought up by a single parent enhance their res sense of responsibility and mature in their self-reliance and they can identify better their goals and values so it is a very important finding so they uh, you know these circumstances make these ch children very resilient to the conditions that they face later in the life and then you again have gay and lesbian people without or with children they can adopt children or they can have their own kids as we described earlier so in this in, in Sri Lanka you know gay and lesbian couples are not they do not have the privilege of uh, having their having having their own kids or even to adapt kids although they're educated but in other countries um, this is actually helping the current uh, problems in the society where uh, you know even orphaned kids are being uh, cared for by these kinds of parents now if we look at a more rational and an inclusive definition of what a family is we are getting this from a sociological perspective a modern 
sociological perspective would be a group of individuals living together who share emotional bonding, a history and a future. And then we move on to look at basic functions of a family. So you can just we can just rush through these. These are not um, you know these are not something that you cannot work out. You can definitely work out around these. So one of the functions would be legitimization of sexual relationships and procreation, that is reproduction. And another would be economic support. So the breadwinner of the family, or sometimes breadwinners of the family, can provide food, shelter, warmth and protection to those dependent in the family. They could be the elderly population or the children, or people who are not earning, but on the other hand, the people, the, the housewives and people who are unemployed also contribute to the family, uh, you know, helping out with household chores and all that. And this is a um, platform where the family forms their social interaction. So interpersonal relationships and social skills start with the newborn establishing eye contact with the mother and that develops over time as the family grows together. And then there is the emotional bonding, love, affection, sense of belonging and this is really important for early childhood development for us to have children without autism and those without social skills. Right. And the roles of a homemaker and a breadwinner is interchangeable. So the traditional view of a family is that the father is the person who is earning and mother is a homemaker. But the roles definitely have interchanged along the history and it will it is continuing at present. So be aware about those when we speak to people, right? And then children play a passive role, rather a passive role, getting nurtured by the parents and being educated and all that. So there are two sorts of impacts. The family can have an impact on the diseases that the family encounters. And the diseases can in turn impact on the family. So we will look at these. This could be one of your OSCE questions. You can, as part of your um, you know, OSCE questions, you could be asked about what sorts of impacts would the family have on disease and disease have on family. So the interaction between family and disease, you can just really work out on these. First of all, we will look at how the family can act as a source of health problems. If we take physical illnesses, infectious diseases such as skin infections, for instance scabies, can spread between the family members due to physical intimacy, which is very common in overcrowded households. Then genetic predisposition, if the father has a certain um, hereditary condition that is that might transmit to the next generation, daughter or the son. And non-communicable diseases because of genetic predisposition as well as the as well as to the fact that the family members tend to share the same physical and psychosocial environment they can um, coincide uh, between different family members at the same time then there are psychosomatic disorders such as alcoholism and marital problems then emotional disorders, for instance, death of a spouse can lead to depression in a living family member. If one of the members has AIDS, that would lead to anxiety, depression and even stigmatization problems among the other members in the family. Marital problems of parents can lead to physical problems in the children, such as acting out and bedwetting. Then we have 
to consider the impact of disease on the family. If one of the members is diagnosed with a certain condition, that may affect the other members in the family. So the family has to adapt for treatment and hospitalization of that member. And patient's dependence on uh, family for care is there. The pa patient's change in the behavior and appearance would affect the other family members. And investigation management related decisions, expenses, economic crisis can all occur due to a disease. And then possibility of death, how to cope up after uh, that person's death and all that. So there, there would also be social issues. If one of the members has AIDS, the fellow members may not be able to attend social events in the village because there can be problems associated with the stigma. Then family can also act as a strength to solve the problem. So most families are very resourceful. So they, one of the members is a breadwinner, so he finances the family and the, one of the other members could give the medication to the, this person at regular intervals and a younger child might be able to bathe the grandmother and uh, keep her uh, personal hygiene well and all that. So the family can act as a uh, resource in overcoming these illnesses and diseases as well. So whatever happens as the family physician, you must always try to maintain confidentiality. For instance, if the person who is presenting to you with a certain illness uh, asks you not to divulge certain information, even to the family members, you have to respect that, unless it poses a threat on the family members or on the society. In summary, we will just place emphasis on the factors that are really important for you to identify in you know while you practice as a family physician or as any healthcare professional so the first thing would be that you have to have some social awareness that is to have an awareness about the culture the practices and how the practices might deviate from the culture in, within the community where you practice so there might be geographical variations but even the family structures that you do not expect to appear in certain communities might appear within the communities so the first thing would be to be sensitive to the problems that these individuals and most importantly the families have and address them accordingly. So you're not just treating one individual, but you are, you, along with the holistic approach that is characteristic of uh, general practice, you have to take care of the whole family because the diseases can affect the family and the families can also act as resources to help the person who is affected by the disease to come out of it so it is vice versa so be sensitive to the issues of the problem the issues of issues of the community that you serve so if you have questions you can post them below under the question section so that i will attend to them the sooner time permits another topic uh, that will be covered later on along the course of family medicine lectures. Thank you.